Open your Bibles back up to Matthew chapter 9 from 37, please. Matthew chapter 9. Everybody's looking so nice, by the way. It's so good to see you guys. You guys don't look too worse for wear considering everything with COVID. So that's something to thank God for. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to go from 37. Thanks so much to Sister Folope who read so well. Um, Okay. So last week we started a series on evangelism. Everyone look up at me, by the way. Because I know it's something that's really weird about people in the UK. They always like look down at their laps when the sermon's going on. It's really, really weird. I want all of you guys to do me a favor. Help me out. Because it, gives, it encourages me when I know you're all concentrated and I make sure that you stay looking up at me. Some of you are a bit afraid of eye contact. It's going to get very awkward because some of you I might stare at you for a long time. But don't worry, that's fine. Eye contact is a good thing here in London, so let's try and maintain eye contact. Okay, but we started a series last week on evangelism. And the topic we dealt with was the world's need for evangelism. This week, if you got our message late last night, today's topic is going to be equipment for evangelism. Everyone say equipment. Say it better than that. Equipment for evangelism. Now, I don't want to say this is a spiritual gift, but I have a gift of discernment. And I can tell when you guys are smiling at me or not, even though you're wearing masks. Usually because your eyes end up squinting. So I want you to do me a favor and encourage me with your eyes as well. Okay, equipment for evangelism. And our main scripture is Matthew 9 verse 37. So let's, let's go back through it again. Um, then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. So point number one. Point number one. Okay, equipment for evangelism. Point number one. You are needed. That's point number one. You are needed. Some of you, you'll be used to this. You already know this. You may have heard sermons like this in the past. You may be aware of these kind of things. So some of you may already know these things, but I want you to bear with us because everybody's at different stages of learning. The first thing you need to know is you are needed. It is not a one-man mission. Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, he is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, he is the Messiah, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the one who says, we need more laborers. The harvest is plenty. There are loads of souls to be reaped for God, for the Father. But we need more laborers. We need more laborers. There's a side note here. Those who think they can do Christianity in isolation, it doesn't work that way. We must do Christianity in community, in fellowship. Thank God for social media. Now we have social media. You can watch services on your phone. But why is, if we can watch services on our phone, we can get sermons that we want to hear. Why come to the church? Everybody say community. community. Louder, say community. community. Good. So the first thing we need to know is this is not a one-man mission. Evangelism is not a one-man mission. Every person is needed. Everybody. Everybody is needed. Some of you might say, for example, even here today, there are only a few of us here. All the more reason. Christianity only makes up two billion of the world's population. All the more reason for every individual to evangelize. Every Christian must evangelize. Now, I realized something as I was preparing each time this week for today's sermon. I realized that there are some people here who might just have heard the word evangelism, have no idea what it means. Everybody say the word, I love this word, it's Greek. Say euangelion. It's a weird word, isn't it? I like it. I think it's quite cool. Euangelion. What does that word mean? It literally means gospel. It's the Greek word for gospel or the Greek word for good news. So anytime you see in the Bible, preach the gospel, they are saying preach the euangelion. Now the word evangelism comes from that word euangelion. And it's a bit of a tongue twister. It's euangelizestai. How do you say this? Euangelizestai. Euangelizestai. Everybody say euangelizestai. One more time, say, you and Geli Zestai. Wow, we've got a whole church of people speaking in tongues today. You and Geli Zestai, it literally means preacher of the good news. Preacher of the you and okay? In Greek, it means preacher of the good news. That's where the word evangelism comes from, okay? You and Geli Zestai. If you're struggling to know how to spell that, just go to Google. Google evangelism in Greek and you'll find it there. Now, there are two ways to preach the gospel. Today's topic is equipment for evangelism. There are two ways. The two ways are through public preaching and through individual testimony or personal witness. Okay? Two ways. Through public preaching. Like we said last week, you might go to Peckham or Oxford Circus or Brixton and you'll find one uncle or one auntie saying, the world is going to hell, you must repent. If you don't repent, you're going to die, etc., 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 etc. 
That's public preaching of the gospel. Then there is personal witness of the gospel, where you go to somebody and you testify to what you have seen. That's why it's personal witness. What am I saying? You must encounter God. Enough is enough of coming to church and doing religion, and you don't know God. ID, who was leading praise and worship, was saying it this, this, this afternoon, this early afternoon. What are you doing here if you don't know God? What you should be doing here is getting to know him if you don't know him. Because if you don't know God, if you've seen nothing with, you, with your eyes, if you've heard nothing with your ears, if you've felt nothing in your heart to do with the gospel or because of the gospel, what are you bearing witness to? Two ways to preach the gospel. You preach publicly or you do a personal witness. Now getting back on topic. You have been called to service. You have been called to service. Now even though I said take notes, I'm more concerned that this goes into your heart. So make sure you're still concentrating. You have been called to service. You've been called into the army of God. Everyone say the army, the army. of God. Praise God, there was something in the 1914s, I think it was 1914s, um, or in the 1910s, if you will, the noughties, well, the teens back then, I guess you'd call them. They called it the conscription. When they wanted to go to war, they said that every man from the age of 18, and maybe even 16 at a point in time, if I'm not mistaken, has to go to war. You had no choice. You couldn't stay at home. You couldn't say, but I'm not a part of the army. Every young man had to go to war and basically get ready to die. Or do what they could to survive. Likewise, we have been called into the army of God, which means that we all have a responsibility. Every single one of us has a responsibility. Do you understand what that means? Soon enough, we'll be doing a preaching on manhood and the requirement of responsibility for a man specifically. But that will be coming later. We're not dealing with that today. So make sure you come back. Responsibility is what each one of us has in the army of God. Now, here's what you need to understand. You can be replaced 100%. You can say, well, God, I don't want to do this evangelism thing. I'm too shy. I'm not smart enough. I don't know what to say. And if that's you, we'll come into you later on. You're replaceable 100%. But because you have been called, you will be judged. You will be judged. The word of God is clear. A man will reap what he sows. It is clear. Let the good do good. Let the evil continue to do evil. For God will render to each man according to his work. That's at the end of the Bible. That's at the end of it. So there's no escape in it. Okay? So we're in the army. Therefore, we have a responsibility. Yes, we are replaceable, but we will be judged. Now, what's the big deal? Why is it that we'll be judged if we don't comply? Point two. Okay? Let's look at chapter 10, verse 1. What does it say? And he called to him... He's just said to his disciples, we don't have enough man in the, on, in the road. We don't have enough man on road. We don't have enough man in these streets to preach the gospel. Therefore, pray to the God of the harvest to send more laborers into the harvest. And then he puts his faith to action. Immediately, verse 1, he says, and he called to him his 12, his 12 disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. Now, some of you, if you've got the New King James Version in front of you, you'll see there that he gave them power. Everyone say power. power. One more time. Say power. power. Okay, he gave them power. Now, some of you who have heard that today's topic will be equipment for evangelism, what you're expecting me to tell you is when an atheist tells you this, say this in return. And when you speak to people, make sure you're clear, make sure you this, make sure you that. When you invite them to church, make sure the singing is good. Make sure there are smoke machines. Make sure there are lights. Make sure it looks impressive. That's what some of you might want me to tell you in terms of how to equip you for evangelism. But what did Jesus do? He told them, say this and do that. And so that you can do it, this is what I'm going to equip you with, power. So this is point number two. Evangelism is pointless without power. Write it down. Evangelism is pointless without power. Okay? Evangelism is pointless without power. Now I find it very interesting... In fact, before we even go there, evangelism is pointless without power. That's why Romans chapter 1, verse 16, you can write that down, okay? By the way, if some of you want to ask questions, we'll be bringing our Bible studies back soon. So you can ask questions during our Bible studies, which take place on Wednesdays from 7.30 p.m. over Skype. Cheeky plug. But it's for your good. Romans 1, 16, what does it say? For I am unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everybody who believes. First for the Jew. Then for the Gentile, the gospel is the power of God. 
1 Corinthians 2, verse 4 to 5. 1 Corinthians 2, just write first core. Chapter, chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. The first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. He says, therefore, we did not come to you with wise and persuasive words, so that your faith would not rest upon human wisdom, but upon demonstrations of the Spirit's power. Okay? Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Luke 24, verse 49. What does Jesus say to his disciples? He say, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Then he goes on and says, go to Jerusalem, wait there until you have been given power from on high. So Jesus tells his disciples, go and preach to all the world. But before you go, stop, wait, receive power first. Otherwise, your preaching of the gospel will be in vain. Evangelism is pointless without power. Peter who a little sissy girl came to him and said, don't I know you? You're that guy who's hanging out with Jesus. You should get, what, what's the word? Is it queft on sight? Is that, is that the word that people use, is it? Or chinged on sight, Abby. You should get killed on sight. You're that guy who's chilling with Jesus. He says, I don't know him. I never heard of him. Don't know him. Denies him three times. He even says, I swear to God, I don't know this guy. That's what Peter says. This very same Peter on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, where Jesus was just crucified, or just outside of Jerusalem, where Jesus was crucified. This is the very same Peter which is going to the Jews and saying that this Jesus who you man crucified, God has made him both Lord and Messiah. Because he rose from the dead. Peter had power. But God said, do not move. Don't do a thing until you have received power. Now that power is the Holy Spirit. And the interesting thing is, you see this church is called Kingdom Wisdom and Power Ministries. Some of you just think that that's some long name because quote unquote, it's a Nigerian church. Newsflash, one, it's not a pointless name. And two, it's not a Nigerian church. It's an international church. If somebody asks you, why is your church called Kingdom Wisdom and Power Ministries? Let me help you understand. The Jews, the Jews were like Nigerians, a very proud people much like Nigerians. And before you came and told them that, yeah, I've heard from God, you had to give a sign. They were looking for demonstrations of power. So the tagline for this church, the tag scripture for this church is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24 or verse 27. I can't remember. And it says that to the Jews, Jesus Christ is weak. To the Gentiles, Jesus Christ is foolish. But to us, Jesus Christ is both the wisdom and the power of God. The, the, the Jews were looking for power, like Nigerians. Many of them, if you tell them theology, they don't really want to hear it. They'll be falling asleep on the chair. But if you, now, if you raise somebody from the dead, you'll now see everybody speaking in tongues. As if God is not working through the wisdom. Oh, let me give you another example. When they say KWPM, they'll say power. power. It's funny, they never say wisdom. Nigerians are like Greeks. You can give them theology, you can give them different worldviews, but what they really want is power. They're like the Jews, sorry. Now... The British people or the English people or the Westerners, many or the Greeks, they're like the Gentiles or the Greeks. They're not really looking for witches and wizards. They don't really care too much about that. What they're looking for is wisdom. Give me some intellect. Give me some philosophy. Let's talk about Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Thomas Aquinas. Let's talk about these different men. Let's reason together. What wisdom have you got for us? And the Bible says that to the Greeks... Jesus Christ is foolishness. It makes no sense. How can somebody die and rise from the dead and you believe in him and now everybody's saved? I don't understand. And to the Jews, he's weak. They were looking for a Messiah, a birdman king, who was going to come and get Romans, the Romans out of here, deliver us from captivity. And he died on a cross, which was the most embarrassing way to die. You've seen those pictures about Jesus on the cross, right? With the white stuff around his, his waist? No, they crucified people naked. Now, how many of you men are ready to stand here and strip down? I heard my bro say, no, nah, I'm good. That's exactly what they did to Jesus. Stripped him down, scourged him, crucified him. That doesn't look strong. But to us Christians, he is both the wisdom and the power of God. We'll talk about ministries and kingdom later. But if you want a short version for that, we have to minister the kingdom of God in wisdom with power. Anyway, anyway. Acts 17. You need to know your audience. You notice in Acts 17, Peter, 
Peter, not even Peter, Paul, sorry. Paul goes to the Gentiles. I think it's Areopagus, something like that. He's going to the Greeks. And you notice he's not healing the sick. He's not raising the dead. What he's doing is telling them that I saw in your Greek temple that you have to the unknown God. And one of your Greek philosophers said this. Well, actually, when you look at Christianity, X, Y, and Z. So even your Greek philosophers testify that this God is good and you should serve him. Kind of like when you go to a Muslim and the Muslim tells you the Bible has been corrupted. And you tell them, well, hold on. Your Quran tells me that I should read my Bible. It says, let the people of the book judge by what has been revealed therein. So know your audience, but that's not even what we're talking about today. Evangelism is pointless without power. Point three. We'll see if we can even get through all of it because there's a lot. And I told you this is a series. It's funny. As I was preparing for this, each time I prepared, more things were coming. And this is just from three verses. Yo, the Bible is deep. Point three. Notice. You have been given power. It is not like the Old Testament days. Oh, man of God, man of God, you are a man of God as well. You are a woman of God as well. You have power as well. Everybody who is a Christian, who is a child of God, has power. Every one of you has power. So that's point three. You have been given power. It is no longer a one-man show. Back in the Old Testament, everybody goes to the prophet. Somebody like Samuel, so powerful and used mightily of God. That no word he spoke fell to the ground. Literally everything he said happened. That's how potent the power of God was upon his life. Back then they were so afraid of the power of God. That Samuel went to Jesse's house. That's David's dad. Went to his house. Jesse comes out to greet him and he says, Yo, is everything okay? Because prophets don't come around here unless there's bad news. Unless we're all screwed. And so Samuel says, no, it's all good, my G. I've come to anoint a new king. That's how much power they had in the Old Testament. That same power is at work in the life of every believer. It's at work in the life of every believer. It is not just a one-man show. That is why Jesus Christ has redeemed for God, you see in the book of Revelation, a kingdom of priests. There isn't one priest. You are all priests. You are all ministers. Every single one of you. God has purchased from himself through Jesus Christ a kingdom of priests. What does a priest do? A priest renders service unto God on behalf of the people. Their sole thing is to serve God. That is why you as the kingdom of priests, you see, whether you eat or you drink, whether you're asleep or you're awake, do everything that you do unto the glory of God. It is the priesthood of every believer. That's why Jesus Christ is the high priest. There's got to be some priests around for there to be a chief priest or a high priest. You guys are priests as well. And Jesus Christ is the high priest. You have been given power. And this is not some abstract power. I want to speak to the individuals who have come to church. And they come to church and we hear, Father, give us power, 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 power. And you're like, but where's the power, bro? I see all you men speaking in tongues, but how many of you are actually sanctified? Gossiping against one another. What a shame. You guys know what I'm talking about. I see all of you, man, come in here praying power, power. I ain't seen the dead raised. I ain't seen people healed. Where's this power? So some of us young Christians, we have fallen into this idea that God's power is abstract. Yeah, we're filled in power, but we don't really believe it. No, this power is not an abstract power. It is a power that is effective and efficient. But guess what? You won't know whether the power is in you until you obey. Can you imagine the disciples? Jesus said, they're the one who testified. Jesus Christ gave us anointing or he gave us power to cast out demons. What do you think they felt? Do you think that they felt chills in their body when they received power? What do you think they felt? Jesus says, okay, boom, I've given you all power. Go out and cast out demons. Do you think that people were falling down on the ground? These were the disciples. They believed in Jesus Christ already. But guess what? They didn't know that the power was in them until they went out and cast out demons. Until they went out and did what it is that God instructed them to do. Likewise with you. God has given you power. But as long as you sit on your derriere, you're not going to know the power that's in you. Until you go and put it to work. Some of you are going to university. Until you get out there and preach the gospel. You're not going to know the power within you. So go and sit down there. Keep saying that you're shy. Keep saying that you don't know what to do. Keep saying you don't know anything. Keep sitting on your derriere. Let me, let me make you understand something. Faith without works is dead. 
Faith without works is dead. If God has given you power, go out there. Don't put God to the test, but go out and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out that power that God has put inside of you. Now, let's talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we love this one. How many people in here can speak in tongues? Raise your hand. Good, I'm, I'm bringing it right. Oh, one, two, that includes me, three. Okay, how many people have raised the dead? How many people have worked miracles? How many people have the, the word of the message of wisdom? How many people have the word? Okay, how many people here can be helpful? Raise your hand. Oh, you didn't know that was a gift of the Holy Spirit. Being helpful is a gift of the Holy Spirit. There aren't just nine gifts. There's more than nine gifts. And they are manifest in many, many, many different ways. Many different ways. So when I say you've been filled with power, that power manifests in different ways. How do we know that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are the demonstrations of the Holy Spirit, which is power? Everybody say charisma. charisma. Say it with some actual charisma. 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 Now everyone say charismata. charismata. Charismata comes from the word charis. Somebody might name their child charis in future. Charis means grace. Charismata is the word that's given for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We see that Paul says that like one abnormally born, Jesus Christ lastly appeared to me and gave me the ministry unto the Gentiles. And he says that I was not least of the apostles. No, I worked more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was at work within me. So what does that mean, grace is? Grace is not just the unmerited favor of God that gives you salvation. Grace is the power of God within you to sanctify you. Grace is the power of God that works through you to do the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we see that there is grace for salvation or soteriology. And there is grace power. Everyone say grace power. So you all have been given that grace power. And as we said before, this gift of God, you notice that Jesus Christ gave them this power. Some of you will say, oh, you know, I have to do this in order to receive power from God. No, power is a gift from God for every believer. And it manifests in different ways. How do we know? We've heard of the fivefold ministry, the fivefold. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, when he ascended, he gave gifts unto men. To some he gave apostles, to others prophets. Some he gave evangelists, teachers, pastors. Those are gifts of the Holy Spirit to the church. Okay? And in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4 to 7, verse 8 to 16, and in verse 20, 28, you see some examples of gifts. Point number four. Point number four. Do not underestimate the power of God in you. Remember, I'm not going to stand here and tell you all the things you can do that would... You could apply all of those things. If you have no power, it will be pointless. Do not underestimate the power of God in you. Some of you are sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, oh, Yeah, but I'm not special. And I don't know how to preach. And uh, 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 I'm shy. Please, please don't underestimate the power of God. Some of you sitting here, you think you're not special. That's the point. It's not about you. You're not meant to be special. Newsflash, you're not special. Some preachers are teaching you, well, you know, God just loves you so much. And because he knew you were so special, he just said, oh, I'm dying to die for these guys. Please. Yes, he loves you. But no, you are not special. Yes, you can be replaced. But God loves you such that he would give you the pleasure of partaking in his will. That he would give you the pleasure of glorifying him. You are not special, and God wants to keep it that way. How do we know? How do we know? Now, of course, yes, you're special in one sense. I'm a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a royal saint, called to his glory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're special in one sense, but in another sense, you're not special. How do we know? Number one, as I said, God in Christ gave the disciples power. Another thing you need to know, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Paul, in chapter 11, he says, or well, I think it's at the beginning of 12. He says, because he's trying to defend his apostleship, because there are false apostles out there saying, well, he's not an apostle, he can't speak in tongues. He's not an apostle, he can't raise the sick, he can't raise the dead, blah, 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 blah. And Paul is here saying, well, first of all, I showed you all the marks of an apostle, which is miraculous powers, I saw the risen Christ, etc., etc. Second of all, he says, I'm not even going to boast about what I've seen, but I can boast about somebody else. And he's talking about himself, by the way. I can boast about somebody else who was taken to the third heaven, whether in the flesh or in the spirit, 
I do not know. I will boast about such a man. Then he goes on to say, before verse, 11, verse 9 of chapter 12, he says, But so that I would not become conceited, God gave me, not the devil, by the way, God gave me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, a messenger of Satan. And I prayed three times. I prayed three times. Where have we heard that before? If this bitter cup could pass from me. I prayed three times that God would remove this thorn from my flesh. And what did Jesus say to him? Jesus said, "Ah, no. Why? First of all, my grace is sufficient for you. But sometimes we miss the second part. Second, when you look weak, when you don't look special, when you don't seem charismatic, when you don't seem eloquent, that is when my power is made perfect before the people. Oh Lord, I'm simply asking for your people, but also for me, that Lord, you would help us to manifest your power in our lives for the glory of your name. And Lord, having been used for your glory, do not allow anybody here to be disqualified, but help all of us, Lord, to inherit your glorious kingdom. Lord, let us begin to see signs and wonders, including those that we don't even know that are signs and wonders. And Lord, let your name be glorified. I pray for myself, Lord, that having preached and taught others, I would not be disqualified. That you help me to be disciplined in the way I need to be, Lord, so that I can inherit the crown that you've got stored up for me. And I'm praying for all these here, Lord, that they too will inherit the crowns that you've got stored up for them. And that your name will be glorified and that we will not just rejoice here but in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? That's what I'm talking about.